Good morning, friends. We welcome you to another Sunday School lesson from here at Salem Creek Church of Christ. I hope you have had a good week since we were last together. And I want to thank you for tuning in and spending your time with us. We're going to continue our study of the book of Galatians. And by the way, we're just about to wrap this study up. And it's been a very profitable study for me. I hope it has been beneficial for you. If there's any way that we can assist you, Give us a call here. Our office number is area code 615-893-7532. If we can pray for you about something, if we can help you come to a better understanding of the Word of God or how to have a relationship with God through Christ, we would love to be of help to you. Give us a call at that number. We'll get your Bible out, and we're going to read beginning in verse 6 of Galatians chapter 6, and we'll read verses 6 through 10. For the Bible says the one who is taught in the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of faith. Well, our text for today contains what seem to be two totally unrelated points. However, if you take a little bit closer look at them, maybe they're more closely related than we might think. The overall subject here in these verses is God's law of sowing and reaping. As it's stated here, whatever a person sows, they will reap. And let me say in the very beginning that that is an immutable law. It is an irrevocable law. You will reap what you sow. If you sow corn, the harvest you reap is going to be corn. Well, the very first verse of this passage of Scripture says, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Then the rest of it talks about God's law of sowing and reaping. How can those two possibly be related? Ah, oh, but think about this. The one who is teaching the word of God is sowing the seed of the kingdom. And if the one who sows the seed of the kingdom is compensated for his efforts, he is at least in that respect reaping what he has sowed. Galatians chapter six and verse six, without question supports the idea that those who give their lives to preaching and teaching the word of God may indeed be financially supported for their labor. That's also taught in other biblical passages, by the way. Sometimes people want to challenge that idea. But think about another passage written by the same author, the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 14, he's discussing this very topic. In fact, he discussed it in greater detail there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Listen to what he says in verse 7 of that chapter. Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard but does not eat the fruit of it? Who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? And then he quoted scripture in order to prove his point. He went back to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 4 where the law of Moses said, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. If that ox spends his labor to thresh the grain, don't muzzle him, allow him to eat of that grain. Now Galatians chapter six and verse six talks about the one who is taught the word of God. That person, the one taught the word of God, is to support the one who does the teaching. Leon Morris in uh, his commentary on the book of Galatians says that the one who was taught refers to what he called the rank and file membership, or sometimes we say the average membership of the church, those who are being taught as opposed to the one who is doing the preaching. Well, Morris went on to say that the person who was taught was receiving priceless instruction 
from one who, as far as we know, had no regular source of income. Therefore, the one who was taught the word was called upon to be a sharer of all good things. Paul, of course, was not the only one uh, to endorse that principle. In the 10th chapter of Luke's gospel, Jesus sent 70 of his disciples out on a commission to teach the word of God, the gospel of the kingdom. And he told them that when they entered into a house, and that house was owned by a man of peace, they were to remain there. Jesus said, stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you. Let me pause right there in the middle of that sentence to say, that's talking about receiving support from those people. You go to that house, you stay there, you eat and drink what they give you. And then he backed it up with this principle, for the laborer is worthy of his wages, do not keep moving from house to house. Luke chapter 10 of verse seven. Let people support you for the work that you're doing in preaching the good news. Well, in Galatians chapter six and verse seven, he moved on from that part of his message to shift his focus from supporting those who minister in the word to really a moral, shall we say, a spiritual application of God's law of sowing and reaping. Galatians chapter six and verse seven says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he will reap also. Do not be deceived. We're going to look at several parts of this verse in succession here. The first thing he says is, do not be deceived. Do not be misled. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. God's law of sowing and reaping is irrevocable. If you think you can circumvent it, by the way, not only are you deceiving yourself, you put yourself in the position of mocking God. So he says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Well, to mock God, that certainly is very serious business. Look at how this term is defined and you'll see that there are several very descriptive um, uh, synonyms, shall we say. Are you mocking God? What that really means is you're turning your nose up at God. You're treating God with contempt. You think you were so smart that you can outwit God. That's exactly what you're doing. When you think that you can circumvent God's law of sowing and reaping, or in other words, when you think you can sin with impunity, that you can sin and get away with it, that God doesn't notice, that God will not judge, then you put yourself in a position of mocking God, trying to outwit God. And that's certainly something that any sensible person would seek to avoid for the simple reason. A person is going to reap what they sow. Listen again to the flow of this verse. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. A very wise person said, and I quote, it's not the reapers who decide what the harvest will be, but the sowers. The one who goes out to reap the harvest is not the one who decides what that harvest is going to be, understanding that in the time Paul wrote these words, sometimes the one who reaped the harvest might be different from the one who had sowed the seed. You know, <clears throat> while we might prefer a different outcome, we can't change God's law. Whatever you sow, that's exactly what you're going to reap. If we sow to the flesh, Paul says we're going to reap corruption. I don't think any of us want to do that. And by the way, 2 Peter chapter 1 of verse 4 says that since we have become partakers of the divine nature, we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Those two things go hand in hand, partaking of the divine nature and escaping the corruption that is in the world. We do not want to harvest corruption. On the other hand, <clears throat> he says here, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, that if we sow to the Spirit, we will harvest eternal life. And right here we meet one more time 
two elements that we've talked about several times in our study of the book of Galatians, especially chapter 5 and chapter 6, two opposing realms, if you will, the flesh and the spirit. If you sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you reap eternal life. In this passage, those two different realms, the flesh and the spirit, represent two different fields. One of us, each one of us will sow seed in one of those two fields. The great Bible scholar John Stott made a very important point when he said, and I quote, we are not the helpless victims of our nature, temperament, and environment. On the contrary, what we become depends largely on how we behave. Our character is shaped by our conduct, end of quote. I would add to that this thought. Our conduct is shaped by what we think within our hearts. Let me share that quote again with you. We're not helpless victims of our nature, our temperament, and environment. On the contrary, we become depend what, what we become depends largely on how we behave. Our character is shaped by our conduct, end of quote. And always remember, conduct is determined by our thoughts. It's determined by our attitudes. Now the point is this. When you reap that harvest, and the harvest you reap is corruption, don't blame fate or chance or God or other people or bad luck for the harvest that you're reaping, understand that as you go through life, you reap exactly what you sow. Are you sowing to the spirit or are you sowing to the flesh? You'll notice also that uh, there's an emphasis given in Galatians chapter five and verse six to the Holy Spirit of God. In Galatians five, it is our duty he says, to walk by the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 6, it is our duty to sow to the Spirit. Think about the path where we walk. Think about the field where we sow the seed that we sow. As we walk by the Spirit, we're going to be sowing seed in the Spirit's field. How can we expect to reap the fruit of the Spirit, for example, if we're not sowing to the Spirit. Or to look at it another way, how can you expect to reap the fruit of the Spirit if you were sowing to the flesh? And that's the very reason why some people find nothing but destruction in their lives. They reap what they have sowed. And you remember that we're talking about, what we're talking about has eternal consequences. You go back and Look at what Paul calls the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 19. At the very end of that list, you find these words, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Think about that. Think about consequences. When you read the words, the one who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Well, you might be asking, what does it mean to sow to the flesh? That simply means to pander to the flesh, to cuddle the flesh, to stroke it instead of crucifying it. The seeds that we sow are largely thoughts and deeds. And every time we allow our minds to harbor a grudge, to nurse a grievance, to entertain an impure fantasy, or wallow in self-pity, are we not sowing to the flesh? What are we doing when we linger in bad company whose insidious influence we cannot resist? What are we doing every time we lie in bed when we ought to be up and praying? What are we doing every time we read pornographic literature, every time we take a risk which strains our self-control? When we do those things, we're sowing to the flesh. And unfortunately, there are some Christians who sow to the flesh every day and then wonder why they do not reap holiness. 
Holiness is a harvest whether we reap it or not depends entirely on where we sow. Those who sow to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Those who sow to the spirit will of the spirit reap eternal life. You know, it's, it's, it's a fact. You cannot circumvent this fact. If you sow corn, you harvest corn. If you sow beans, you expect to reap beans. That's God's law of sowing and reaping. And we cannot possibly change it. If we sow to the spirit, we're going to reap a wonderful harvest. Well, what does it mean to sow to the spirit? Most likely that's the same thing we read about in Romans chapter 8 and verse 6, where Paul talked about setting our minds on the things of the Spirit. It's the same thing you read about in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 and verse 25, where he emphasizes walking by the Spirit. I think he gives a great statement of what that's all about. In Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, listen to these three verses. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's a powerful passage of scripture. If you have been risen with Christ really has the meaning of since you have been risen with Christ, Keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is and he's seated there at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth because you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Think about Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 where he says, I've been crucified with Christ and nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we're sowing to the Spirit when we set our minds on the things of the Spirit. Think about the company that you keep. If you associate with godly people, it's a whole lot easier to sow to the Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, evil companions corrupt good morals. And, and so if we want to sow to the Spirit, we have to surround our people who are trying to do the very same thing for encouragement, for mutual edification. You've got to be involved in spiritual pursuits, pursuing the things that are above. And, and so I just ask you a, a few practical questions this morning. What type of leisure activities do you pursue? Do you pursue things that are based on greed? Some people ask me, well, preacher, what do you think about gambling? Well, at its heart, there's nothing good about it because it is based on the principle of greed. Am I sowing to the spirit when I pursue something like that? Do I watch television shows or movies that promote and glorify sexual immorality? Let's ask you a question. How can I allow myself to be entertained by that? And at the same time, be sowing to the spirit? It's also true that our spiritual habits have a lot to do with what we sow. I like to think about the very first psalm. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't stand in the way of sinners. He doesn't sit in the seat of the scoffer. The Bible says that that person delights in the law of the Lord and meditates in it day and night. And that psalm also tells us that there is a harvest to be reaped when we sow that type of seed. Verse three of Psalm one says that that person is going to be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither and in whatever he does, he prospers. There again is God's law of sowing and reaping. Sow to the spirit and you're going to be like that fruitful tree planted by the rivers of water and your spiritual life is going to flourish. How much time do you spend reading the Word of God? How much time do you spend meditating on it, making personal application to your own life? How much time do you spend in prayer? What is prayer? Well, 
let's not complicate things. Prayer is simply our communication with God. When he, we read his word and meditate on it, he's, he's communicating to us. It's his word. When we pray to him, we're communicating with him. We're pouring out our hearts to him. You cannot be a spiritually minded person without spending significant portions of time with God. Do you regularly find yourself worshiping God with your family on the Lord's Day? Someone who sows to the Spirit is going to recognize that God is worthy of all of the worship that we can give to Him and so much more, but is going to seek to give that glory and that worship to God along with other people of God. It's important that we realize that our minds are very actively involved in this process. I'm going to reiterate this thought. Our deeds come from what we think in our heart, and our deeds determine our character. An example of that, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28, Jesus has just said, you've heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery. He went on to say, I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 28. That's our Lord's way of saying what's in the heart, what's in the mind determines our actions. So we need to control what we think. We need to control our minds. In that same chapter, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talked about the relationship between murder and hate. The seed planted in the mind leads to the action. So if we're going to be sowing to the Spirit, our thoughts have to be on a deeper level. They have to be on a higher level. They have to be spiritual in nature. We cannot accomplish that if we're not spending significant amounts of time with God. How much time do you spend reading the Word of God? How much time do you spend pouring out your heart to God in prayer? Well, at the end of these verses, our author focused on the good that ought to characterize our lives. And here's just a wonderful suggestion for all of us. Rather than pursuing things that are going to bring us down to a lower spiritual plane, how about we spend some time doing things that are good? In verse 9 of Galatians chapter 6, he said, let's not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. It's easy to get discouraged if we do not see an immediate harvest. Don't grow weary. The harvest is going to come. Keep on sowing to the Spirit. And part of that is seen in the good that we do. And so he says in verse 10, So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who are of the household of faith. How can we sow to the Spirit? Well, we're going to think spiritual thoughts. We're going to do spiritual deeds. We're going to spend time talking to God. We're going to spend time listening to Him as we read and meditate and study His Word. Our actions are going to be spiritual in nature. We're going to do good to all people. And then he says, especially those who are of the household of faith, be mindful of the opportunities to help people, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. I think it boils down to this. How are we to use our lives? Are we to spend our energy and resources on ourselves? Or are we to be mindful of other people? We would never remember with fondness the, the, the selfish people that we have encountered along the way. But we do remember those who have graced our lives with their generosity. God also remembers them. If you spend your time, if you spend your energy, if your life is made up of sowing good things, your harvest is going to be great. Don't be weary in well-doing. As you have opportunity, to do good to people. In doing that, you are sowing to the Spirit. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever person sows, that they are going to reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. On the other hand, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap a bountiful harvest of eternal life. You're going to leave behind a big footprint in this earth. 
You're going to leave behind a whole lot of people whose lives you have blessed because you looked for opportunities to do good to all people. Well, I see that our time is up for this morning. Thank you for tuning in, spending a little time with us. I hope our time spent has been beneficial to you. I'd like for us to close with prayer. Father, we give you thanks for today and every blessing that you give to us for this wonderful passage of Scripture which challenges us, Father. And in those times in which we think we're reaping nothing but destruction, we find ourselves laying flat on our backs in the gutter. Help us to understand that we've been sowing in the wrong place, that you will help us to get up, you'll pick us up, you will enable us to turn away from sowing to the flesh and to focus our lives on sowing spiritual things. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.